thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we have a really interesting uh, talk and presentation and Q&A coming up today with Paula Kearney. Um, so before, uh, before I go ahead with introducing Paula, I just wanted to highlight the public participation networks for those of you who might not know about them. Uh, there's one in every county and they're basically a network of local groups um, who any any kind of groups, community, social inclusion, environment. And if you're involved in a local group, I'd like to uh, encourage you to have a look at them and join up if, you, if you're interested. Um, it's a great way to network with groups. It's a great way to receive information on news and events in your county. And it's a great way to get information on funding as well. And very importantly, it's a great way to get involved in local democracy. I'm a firm believer of local action making a difference. Um, and you know, each of us working working together in our in our local counties, um, and then you know, connecting those actions uh, as well across the, nationally. Um, so you can get involved in county council decision making through committees and also through conversations and submissions that take place through the PPN. So I'll send you all a link to the PPNs, uh, the public participation networks. Uh, afterwards as well in the follow-up information. This this evening we are going to hear from Paula Kearney. Paula is the Biodiversity Officer with Galway City Council and with Biodiversity Officers coming on board in each county I thought it was a good opportunity to um, invite one to speak about the role. So Paula is joining us as I said from Galway City. She holds a BC BSc in Ecology and Environmental Science. She has a HD in Planning and Environmental Law and she's a Chartered Ecologist. She's been in this professional career for 20 years and has provided strategic advice and managed multidisciplinary inputs for environmental impact assessments on a wide range of projects, including wind farms, greenways, roads, water treatment and flood relief schemes. So a whole breadth of, of um, of actions that she's been involved in. In her current role, she's required to facilitate and to coordinate the implementation of the Biodiversity Action Plan. And these, this prior, the, with priority given to developing biodiversity awareness and supporting attitude change in the general public, Galway city staff and officials, developers, architects, engineers, and landowner, uh, landowners. So again, huge breadth of, of people that she's been talking to about biodiversity. Um, she's also involved in the development of nature-based solutions under the Galway City Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Strategy and assists in the planning process to promote sustainable natural alternatives to hard engineering management strategies. So that's the thing she's, she's up to and uh, we'll hopefully hear, we'll, we'll hear now uh, a lot more. So thanks Paula for joining us and I'll pass it over to you. Hey, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Catherine. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, welcome everybody. It's lovely to get such a such a, a group on a on a Monday evening, and a lovely Monday evening, which, which is lovely in October. A nice start to October for us. Um, yes, as Catherine said, a biodiversity officer in Galway City Council. Um, yes, I really I suppose we want to see, just give you a kind of an overview of of my role, which would be reflected in probably in in similar and in different ways in other local authorities, both city and county. Um, sorry, I'm nursing a bit of a cold tonight, so I'm sounding a little bit gravelly, but um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so I'll just get started. Um, so the Heritage, or the Biodiversity Programme is being led by the Heritage Council. And that's really in the last two or three years. There has been obviously a very active um, Heritage Officer um, Programme that's been in existence for numerous years, um, say at least 20 years. And the heritage officers to date have been doing the role, a number of those heritage officers have been doing the role of both biodiversity, so built and natural heritage. So they've been doing sterling work and a, a huge remit and um, an amazing work that's been done uh, with them. So I've worked with some of them over the years on different projects. And Jenna McGuire in Clare County Council, so they've worked with them more closely over the years. Um, so really, I suppose, just with regards to the biodiversity crisis and just obviously the huge remit that the heritage officers had is to basically kind of create roles for biodiversity officers to work alongside the heritage officers to give them that support and to just, I suppose, have more people power, I suppose, in the position, um, you know, so to drive policy and um, policy for change for both our built and our natural heritage. Um, so I was actually um, recruited into Galway City Council. I actually wasn't actually part of this program, so it was a direct um, recruitment through Galway City Council. Um, but in the, so there was five of us that were actually directly um, hired by by local authorities. But under this program, they're actually funded directly by the Heritage Council. So that's they're looking to change that with regards to our positions. And if they do, that'd be great, and might free up some funding. 
for us to deliver some some amazing projects. So the main role, so this would be common to um, the personal number of points are common to, to all biodiversity officers, and that really is to um, facilitate and coordinate the implementation of the biodiversity action plan. Um, and to do that, um, it really needs to be informed by what we call an evidence base. So we need to understand what the biodiversity of our local authority area um, and to do that, we collate information that's available from the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and uh, which is contributed um, to by citizen science and probably your, your good selves. Um, so we collate all of that information. There's also nat national data sets from the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, from very, the IFI, um, Inland Fisheries Ireland, the EPA. There's numerous um, national agencies that we collate that information. So they'd have information about water quality and our water bodies. Um, and then habitats, there's a, a land cover map that's has recently been published by um, the OSI with the EPA. So that's a very valuable piece of information. So that's um, on a geographical information system. So it gives us a high level view of what the land cover is in, in Galway or, or in, the, in the country. Um, so it's a very it's a very powerful and very valuable baseline. Um, but we need to kind of get more refinement in that, more detail. Um, with regards to the types of habitats. So it tells us, you know, different, like if there's improved grassland or agricultural grassland or an urban space, but then there's semi-natural habitats, but it doesn't distinguish between one or another. So um, so as part of the whole biodiversity action plan, we have that, we have really strong baseline, and then we will um, procure the services of ecologists, um, botanists, um, lepidopterists of all various different um, ologies to, to help us build up that baseline to get a very robust view. And what that helps us then is to really prioritise with regards to the pressures and threats to those habitats and species so in my region, within Galway City. Um, so that will that will vary between local authority, obviously depending on your habitats and, and geographically where you are. Um, obviously the, the aquatic and marine environment um, you know, are through and surround Galway City. So they're a very significant um, habitat and provide very significant e ecosystem services and we also have peatlands to the north of the city and um, so really so it's as we've been given kind of I suppose an overview of what we need to do but we have to make it specific to our local authority and to have it a very to make sure the biodiversity action plan is very specific and um, that we have measurable targets um, so that's basically what we'll so the next iteration of the of the Galway and biodiversity action plan will be developed next year and I suppose that will come on to where perhaps we have participation from, from the PPN and they'll have a significant or critical role in that. Um, so the other aspect is to assist in the planning process. That in itself is nearly a full-time job. Um, so we look at compliance, um, we look at applications with regards to impacts on natural ecosystems and equally opportunities then for no, well, what we, our remit is no, um, no net loss in biodiversity, but we also look at opportunities for net gain and so that would be where we're speaking about um, nature-based solutions. So looking at stormwater management using wetlands, whales, using natural um, ecosystems or mimicking nature um, on sites as opposed to putting everything into the storm sewer. So that is a benefit of alleviating the pressure in the storm sewer and flooding downstream. So um, it's really is it's just lending from, from um, what, what nature wants to do um, but hasn't been allowed to do over a number of years because of, of human intervention. Um, again, a significant part of our job, and not just for me, um, our recreation and amenity department is the implementation of the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. So, if you're familiar with Galway City, you may see you may have seen a number of changes over the last five years or so, um, with regards to no more areas, signs up areas preserved for biodiversity, um, and really that was driven by um, the our, we we signed up to the Pollinator Plan and delivered those initiatives, but they equally they could not have been delivered without community input and community support. Um, it started off with the wildflower seed as supposed to change hearts and minds. Now we're moving away from that and very much looking at um, developing and just encouraging the natural seed banks that's there to um, to sustain our, our meadow grasslands. So that's been a huge piece of work and, and, a, and a marked change from our very formal landscaping approaches. So I can't take any credit for that. That was being implemented um, before my time. And uh, so I say I'm just looking to to build upon that, that good work. and. Um, and progress um, our objectives on the pollinator plan, but also on the biodiversity action plan. Um, also advise council on biodiversity related issues, and that can be um, anything really. I suppose we're involved in the, the flood relief scheme for Galway City. So I'm involved in that. And again, very keen interest in these nature-based solutions as opposed to hard engineering. 
um, as Catherine had mentioned at the, at the, at the introduction. So I, say I won't go through all of these things. We'll be chatting about different parts of it as I go through the presentation. Um, and yeah, there's a, an aspect there with regards to funding applications. So hopefully we, um, there's opportunities there for your networks uh, in the future with regards to funding. Um, okay. Um, so a lot of the work, I suppose, the high level work is, is, in, is informed by legislation um, and the map there, they go with the city boundary. And these are designated sites. These are sites that are um, designated under European law. It's called the Habitats Directive, maybe you're familiar with. And so Black Coral here, the River Corps, this is an SAC, so the Special Area of Conservation and a Special Protection Area. SACs are for the protection of habitats and species, and birds are particular to, or the SPAs are particular, special protection areas are particular to birds and wetland habitats. That's Black Corb SP up here, and we also have Galway Bay Complex SAC and Inner Galway Bay um, SPA. So there's significant pressure on these designated sites because obviously there's a housing crisis and um, requirements for infrastructure and development and all of that. So it's a real a real battle, a real struggle, I suppose, really to make sure that these areas are not only um, don't deteriorate in quality, but that they also are, are sustaining. They're able to sustain themselves. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a significant part of my job because the sensitivity of the landscape we're in. And so that there that I suppose those assessments are driven through planning, through appropriate assessment, if you're familiar with that again, that's from the Habitat Directive, and that's in our yeah, that whittles down right into our um our national law, the Planning and Development Act. And we also have our wildlife acts of um I suppose have been the, the main wildlife legislation and protecting our wildlife since the 70s. Um so just I suppose with regards to perhaps maybe your own interests, um the um our goal with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, and as I say, it's managing managing these existing existing meadows. So um I suppose they're just working. We really couldn't do any of it without, without the local communities. They're just amazing, fantastic. Um, and they've really embraced it. And I think just their, their experience then as the meadows um, evolve over the summer months and they're out there collecting information on the different species, the different bumblebees, um, butterflies or different pollinators or birds. Um, and again, they're encouraged to provide that data back to the National Biodiversity Data Centre, which is critical for us to, to understand how good or how bad perhaps our, our insect population. Um, I suppose the pollinator plan is really driven by, is driven for pollinators, but equally our insects there, they are the ones that are suffering the greatest as a result of climate change and land use change. Um, so the pollinator plan is a significant role in Ireland with regards to creating space for, for pollinators and for our insects. Um, as part of that as well, so we have many orchards. Um, so as large as grasslands, many orchards, we're putting up uh, hundreds of bat boxes this year um, and all of our, so these, this is all part of the um, green, healthy green spaces that we work um, with local communities. So these are housing estates all over Galway City. And then um, we have a great team on site and they also have, because I suppose when you change the grassland use from being a mown area, there is a first flush because obviously it had a certain management regime before and maybe there was herbicide use, used or um and again it was mown to the quick um so the first flush can often bring up your your noxious weeds so your ragworth dock thistles um so we work with local communities and showing them how to remove them sustainably um now obviously they provide great value to pollinators as well but they can they are very dominant and they can take over your grassland so it's just in a sustainable way we leave Spits and spots of them around the meadows, and um, very, very valuable this time of year to our bird species. So, and again, for our pollinators and um, throughout summer, but just so they don't dominate this forest, um, they don't dominate the whole grassland. So, we work with local communities um, and provide them with tools um, to actually hire them out. So, we try to make a day of it. Um, it's 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 hard work, but it's it's very very rewarding. As you thin them out over the years, um, they they their their dominance certainly lessens. And so then with regards to our parklands, so they, um, the first slide was really with regards to our community spaces, so these are our parklands. And um, again, our planting schemes, um, they are more formal um, and they, I suppose, lend themselves to that more, kind of more formal landscaping. But the species, the choice, at least 75% of the species are 
contained within the pollinator plan. So they are they are of benefit to pollinators. You may have structural plants in there or nursery plants that may not have the same value to pollinators, but they get the garden. They provide that structure and that support to the um, to plants to take off. So as that evolves, we're hoping to make that more native and more pollinator friendly. As I mentioned, the wildflower middle mixes, there's still a horticultural role um, for them in our very much in our ornamental gardens. Um, again, we're looking to change the practices with regards to that, ensuring that they're a native wildflower stock, but equally, equally that we don't use them near already established grasslands or protected sites or areas where there might be a chance of, of escape. So um, so we are we're moving and evolving all the time. It takes time. I suppose that's that is the thing. And I, I worked in the private sector for a long time. It's very different in the public sector. It does take time to turn the wheel, but but we, we are turning it and, and we'll get there. Um, also part of my job, I get out and about, um, thankfully. Um, so during the various different weeks, Heritage Week, Biodiversity Week, um, I get out with local communities, um, Merlin Woods, they're, they're fantastic support and advocate um, of my role. And they, they really um, supported the getting or employing a biodiversity for a number of biodiversity officers for a number of years. Um, so they've, they've been really a fantastic support to me um, when I started. So um, so yeah, so we go on nature walks. Um, mammals are my background. I've worked with them um, with badgers, otter, deer, bats for a long, long time. Um, so it's lovely to be able to share that knowledge and um, just uh, to, to share that knowledge with local people that have an interest um, in wildlife. Um, as well as that, um, I've also had talks on seagrass mapping. So again, so we're not, a lot of the work today has been like very land-based. So I'm really, I'm trying to cast the eye out into the bay and seeing how we can support the coastal and marine habitats in Galway City. Seagrass has a huge role to play. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, you can see it in low tide this time of year when the, the spring tides and the tide goes way out, you can see areas of it. There's actually a huge area of um beside Black Rock Tower, if you're familiar. Um, so you can actually see it there. But it actually grows like a grass underwater. It's different to seaweed, but um it is at least a third, if not more, um effective at storing and sequestering carbon and then trees and terrestrial meadows. So it's something that we're looking at to research in to see if we can establish those meadows in Galway Bay. Um, again, looking at our carbon balance and how to offset the issues, but the issues regarding climate change. So this is kind of as a form of climate adaptation and climate mitigation. There's also these beds like our kelp beds, they take the energy out of waves, take the energy out of storms. So they're very important. They have a very important role in regards to coastal defence. So again, these are all kind of with regards to the nature-based solutions um, that we were talking about earlier on. Um, a significant uh, part of my job, particularly this year, so most of my funding from the uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service under the Local Biodiversity Action Fund has gone into actually developing a non-native invasive species strategy. Um, this map is actually outdated. Um, the dots are far greater. Um, this is from the, say, the National Biodiversity Data Centre. That was the initial data set I got. But we've been working with local people, they've been sending in records, and it's far more extensive than it looks like on this map. So to, uh, before I started, the areas in red, they were the areas that were being actively treated by Galway City Council, and that was larger for Japanese knotweed. Um, as you can see up there um, in the top left, um, we also have areas of um, giant hogweed, where our aquatic species are, are very, very troublesome. Um, so the carob, and particularly the upper lake in the carob, um, is riddled with it's called Largocyphe major. Um, it's a water weed and it basically chokes. It chokes everything. And um, also zebra mussel that's down there and quagga mussel. So they change. They actually we call them um, biological engineers. They actually change their environment. Um, they're filter feeders. So in a way, you would think they'd be positive. They might clean up the water. But what they do is that they just so outcompete every other um, plant and invertebrate that lives in the water. So they're um, they're a real a major issue. But equally, they are, are as difficult to try and, and resolve. It's very, very, very challenging. So as we're looking at our aquatic and our terrestrial species, so you see there, um, Japanese not at the bottom, the slides at the bottom where Japanese not is coming in from neighbouring gardens. And um, can you see it, it's going between one fence and another. It has, um, I have seen it in places where it's gone through foundations of people's houses. Um, again, it has a significant bearing on our infrastructure. So that is, I suppose why it was prioritised by Galway City Council to treat it. Um, but the problems that we have that we're facing is that we can only treat it on public land. 
So we have we can't go on to private property to treat invasive species. Um, we don't have any authority under the legislation to do that. The National Parks and Wildlife Service enforce that legislation. So as part of the strategy, we're looking to see how we can support people as um when they do have invasive species or they're concerned with invasive species maybe coming from a neighbor's garden or a neighbor's property. If it's coming from public land, we can do something about it. But say if it's coming from private land, we really have our hands tied. But we are looking to see if there is any support, any funding. It's a national, it's a national issue, European issue. And um, yeah, so that is, and it's a, it's a costly exercise. And again, the only effective treatment, unfortunately, for a number of our, our invasives, um, these are controlled by, by legislation, is herbicide. So yeah, it, it, it's, it is an issue, but um, unfortunately, it's a very real issue for a number of people living around Galway City, particularly up around the Menlo area. Um, so we are looking at, so for other other weeds that aren't as troublesome as, as Japanese knotweed, but still um, can cause issues with regards to out-competing all native vegetation. Um, we're looking at, it's a product called foam stream, and it's basically hot water that's insulated, but it's like a, it's like a coconut oil. Um, but they are looking at more sustainable Irish oils uh, to insulate the heat for longer, so it penetrates the plant. The plant. Um, so we have here a horse tail, so we call it mare's tail, and it's been taking over the graveyards there in Briar Hill. And um, so for years, they would have used, gly used glyphosate. So that obviously has issues with regards to health and safety. It was also toxic to the environment. So we're looking for non-toxic, non-invasive um, methods as much as possible. Um, so I've been working with the local parks team um, with regards to that. Um, another, I suppose, passion project of mine, um, we just had a workshop there on Saturday, um, and that's ponds. So the one thing I suppose we're not doing at the moment with regards to our community work, uh, say we have orchards. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Harris Corner initiative. It started off by Byrne Bio and Clare. I think it's been taken up now by um, the Wild Atlantic Nature Project. And again, that's working with local communities on establishing meadows and um, creating space for nature really is, is what it's about. Um, so it's a, again, woodlands, um, meadow grasslands, but they've also introduced ponds and again, ponds can support at least a third percent of our carbon, can sequester carbon, particularly if there's lots of vegetation um, in the pond. And the periphery of the pond, that dies back and stores the carbon at the bottom of the pond. Because there's no water, no moving water connection, the carbon stays in the system. So I have loads and loads of information with regards to ponds, if anybody's interested in that at all. So they can be big features. There's a little girl down there in the bottom, um, on the bottom left. Um, they can be very small. Um, or to some, and basically the bottom of a, a hamster cage and they just sunk that into the garden and the wildlife that it attracted in a very very short space of time was just amazing i, I put a pond in my own garden and uh, i like to um practice what i preach so um, i'm very much a hands-on learner so just yeah so i can um, help people with regards to establishing plants in their own gardens and again in um in more maybe formal areas there's uh, features called rain gardens um, and they are basically like a box made of pallet that's lined and that controls your downwash. So it can be done in people's houses as well. And um, again, it, creates, it, it manages your stormwater more effectively, creates a space for wildlife and, um, and takes the pressure off the storm sore. And so they, there's very, they come in various different forms. Again, if you have the space, but really from, I think from the Harris Corner to get funding, I think it has to be five metres by eight metres, um, which is, you know, that's sizable. But um, I'm sure there are other funding streams out there to create smaller spaces, but equally at very little cost. Because to do something like that, you're talking about maybe two and a half or three thousand, particularly if you need liner. So that's something that maybe a community can come together and maybe do. As an individual, it is a costly endeavor, but there's so many options. And if you have clay, heavy clay soil, you might even need a liner. So, um, but just the wildlife, and particularly in our drought conditions, um, and those early spring droughts having water so for, for birds to be able to bathe um to hydrate and obviously then it's a refuge for our amphibians um our frogs and newts and then this time of year just full of dragonfly and damselflies so um yeah so they're vital and again for insects supporting our pollinators regards to food and meadows are very important but a number of in our insects also start off their life in water so dragonflies damselflies midges might be as popular with people, but again, a great um, source of food and they attract your bats and um, swallows, house marten um, into your garden. So 
um, when once the ecosystem establishes, if the prey are there, the predators will come. Um, so to just uh, achieve that ecosystem imbalance. Um, so this is just, sorry, it's a very pixelated side, I apologize, but this is where it was a community um, project where they're digging out upon, they had an area of land um, that was under agreement with the local authority. Um, so everything was used on site. So they excavated the material and then they used those mounds to create um, space for orchards and also um, created um, lovely um, interactive play areas for children. Um, so, and again, just as uh, there was a good seed bank there already, it's just about managing the, the spring meadow. So very little work had to be done with them other than just mowing and just, um, you know, thinning the, the noxious weeds. But, um, so that was that was a very, it was a beautiful initiative and, um, and I say a great space, a, a great community project and great community effort to deliver a project like that. Um, I suppose the thing maybe about if you're thinking about it in your own um in your own land or your own community, um the major concern uh, I had I was at a talk with regards to the Harris Coroner initiative, and it's something that we may roll out in Galway City and Galway County may also do it. Um but the problem is is um is planting stock. That's one of our biggest problems. So the Harris Coroner initiative on its own, that's only two counties. So that's um actually I think Carlo might be doing some of it as well, but Claire, Mayo, I say Carlo. They need to plant, with regards to the, the initiatives they're rolling out, um, one and a half million trees. But there's only a million trees in the country available. Um, and obviously they're providing for all other initiatives and all other tree planting schemes. So what's happening, obviously, that we have um we have a huge, I suppose, gap in the market with regards to nurseries, but then we're importing stock. And the problem obviously with importing stock is the introduction of invasive species, and not just the plants, it's what comes in, in the soil. So these pathogens, um, we have the oak processionary moth is annihilating our oak species as a potential to it. It's um, run rampant in the UK, killing um, 500 year old oaks. And it's just, um, so that came in and planting stock from, from the continent. Then pathogens, there's alder disease, um, it's phycopterous and that. Um, so again, so these are microorganisms that you can see, but they are coming in and importing material. Um, so for us to try and bypass that or to have more confidence in our planting is to basically plant our own. And that's something I'm, I'm quite passionate about and something I'd look to see if there's any support for communities to be able to grow trees. Now, the problem is, as a lead in time, it's not immediate. You need a minimum of three years, but you can have it on rotation. So you really have whips um, after that time. And you can leave areas kind of, you know, to, to grow on trees um, much longer. But I think to be able to to plant, to grow and plant in your local area and then any surplus, you can donate that to, that to other um, communities. So that's something, um, it's really only something I've been thinking about very recently. And I need to kind of develop or understand the practicalities of it with regards to planning and um, and training. So actually getting training from horticulturists to actually come to meet communities and to actually be able to establish your own nursery. So that's not just for woody materials, not just for trees, but also for any other planting that you want to do as part of your um, your work. Um, and again, just learning the skills, the skills to be able to grow your own food as well, as well as plants. And um, yeah, so great little cottage industry. There's real potential there for people that might have interest to have green fingers, people that don't, like myself, um, but certainly learning. And yeah, so I think that's that's something I'm quite keen on supporting um, communities um, in, the, in the coming years. Um, what we've also done, we're working with the Vincent Wildlife Trust and just mapping our green spaces in Galway. And what's critical to that is joining the dots. Um, so the corridors, and that really supports animals with regards to well, genetic diversity that they're able to move and breed with wider populations. That helps them to be more resilient to disease. But also corridors um, assist them in moving from um, storms or the effects of climate change. So it's very, very important to have, I suppose, that connectivity up through the city, around it and through it. Um, so um, Vincent Wilder Trust did some mapping for me to try. So they use its um, electrical um, theory, um, electrical circuit theory, using landscape features as, um, as resistance to the movement of animals. So... Um, very, very useful tool um, and it's something that the work we have, the, the model just finished. 
So it's again working with local communities and I pro pro provide training and bat detectors to actually see actually are bats using these corridors? Are they in the area? Is there anything we could do better to maybe link up um, corridors for wildlife? So um, again, the whole citizen science piece, again, we couldn't do our job without people active on the ground. And I have to say any events we've had, um, any workshops with bats, they've been the ones that have been bats and ponds have been the ones that have been best attended, maybe because it's kind of an elusive elusive or just that nocturnal side of things where people and especially young kids are really fascinated really interested in them so um, I'm looking to kind of build upon that and encourage people and provide them with the skills to be able to go out down along their road or around their community and um, and see if they can afford any bat species that help us understand what we have in the city and where they're going and equally how we can um, increase and improve their habitat for them um, but it also it indicates um, the movement of other wildlife. Bats are just particularly sensitive, particularly to light and, and human disturbance. But um, but then obviously the movement of wild, but also the movement of people, how people can move through the city safely without so active travel, not having to rely on their cars. So um, again, looking at how we can maybe use our green spaces to benefit biodiversity, but also to benefit people being able to get out of their cars and walk from the 15 minute city, I think is what's been bandied around. But so it's part of a much bigger piece um, with regards to our green spaces strategy. Um, another thing, I, I don't know if it's um, something that's in, in your communities, um, but in Galway City, there's no water um, in the east of the city. And other than the Terryland River, that um, is a tributary of the of the Carb, but the Merlin Park stream is dry for the last 20 years, and that's basically because of all the development up around Duishka and the east of the city. That used to, it was... It's all limestone there, so it's all charlocks and very shallow subsoils. And um, but it's really has, yeah. So with regards to that, there's a great number, great diversity of species in Merlin Woods, but they they could be so better supported if we provide the water back into the into the woods. So the the water was um it would have emerged up near the Galway Clinic. I don't know if anybody's familiar. There, there used to be a big turlock there and um, so that then fed the Merlin Park stream and then it disappeared into a, a swallow hole, a cave under the ground um, on the old Dublin road and then went off to the sea there near Belly Locken. Um, so we're looking to bring that water above ground but it is not straightforward because it is now at least two metres underground. So that's something that's, it's a, it's a long-term project for me. It's very, very, very challenging. And obviously flood and all, flooding and all of that that comes with it. So, But it is, it's a, it's a project we are working on. So in the interim, what we've done just recently, we dug some ponds at Merlin Woods and um, it was an area that was kind of, you know, low lying um, and held some water. And so we just expanded and extended that wetland area. And now we have we have water and we just have to see over time it's not lined. So we're just going to see over time if it holds water. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll line it. But we really are hoping that Mother Nature help us out and keep it as natural as possible. Um, also working on sand dune restoration. Um, that's in Grattan Beach. Um, some nice sand fencing up there. Unfortunately, the storm took, yeah, it took a bit of a hit over the weekend there. But um, you know, I've got seagrass snapping up there again. So this is an area where we're working with the universities and um and local communities on monitoring um basically the co the coastal ecosystem right from the dry grassland sand dunes right out into the into the foreshore. And um, so the Galway Atlantic Aquarium as well, they're, they're fantastic. They're out there every other weekend with local communities um, teaching them what to look out for in rock pools and working with kids. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a fabulous, it's a really lovely project to work on. Um, so I'd say I'm not, not on my own, I'm on my own in the city, but um, but there is a number at least, I think it's 20 of us all together. Um, 16 are under the, um, the Heritage Council and the others are say, directly employed by the local authorities. And actually in Dublin, but you see those with the the star that's um, beside the name there. Um, so yes, yeah, so, and they're growing every day. There's another another person joined us today. So you see, there's adverts out for biodiversity officers every other week. So they're looking to have a presence in every local authority, and um, we all come with different skills. Um, but equally, we can't do it all. We can't do it by ourselves by any stretch of the imagination. So we very much um, rely and wish to work with local communities. Um, and helping and deliver the ambitions for biodiversity within our local authorities. Um, then with regards to funding, um, this, I, I don't know who sent me this publication. It might have been one of the, I think it might have been um, the um, Barnett Tidy Towns actually. Um, 
Yeah, so it's a publication that was put together by the Lions Club and it's fantastic and it has a list of all of the funding. Now this is from 2022, but it basically gives you an idea of all the funding that's available for environmental um, and biodiversity projects. It's it's a fantastic repository. I don't know what I do with that, it's so hard. And I find it hard to navigate what funding is available. Um, so I can't imagine how difficult it is for, for local communities. So um, so that's certainly a good place to start. As I say, it's out of date a little bit, but it, it's, it's a really, really good start. Um, so if anybody wants a publication, I'm more than happy to circulate and give it to Catherine. She can circulate it to yourselves and give you an idea of what's available out there. Yeah, so that's me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, amazing overview there and yeah lovely to see all all the links between the community projects and um as you said just that all that working together to 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 get all these things going um there's loads of questions already come in in the chat so we'll go through a few of them um okay. i also had one just about the the maps you mentioned a fair few of them there the land cover map um the invasive species map and the ecological corridor map um i know some of these seems like ones that you're putting together or working with people to put together now, but will, mm -hmm. they, will, will this be something that all biodiversity officers are doing in each county? Uh, so will this be something that's available for people in each county uh, through biodiversity officers? Yeah, um, and it very much depends on the um, the resource that they have in house as well, the GIS, the graphic information systems and uh, technicians that they have. Um, and some counties will have them already and other counties won't. But it is, it's an ambition for each biodiversity officer to collate all of that biodiversity information. And um, it is, it's a fair, it's a fair amount of work. And then you know, we may have to procure consultants as well or, you know, specialists in um, geographic information systems to um, to collate this. So the moment I say, I'm, I'm kind of looking to see where the gaps are. And then, so we had a ground truth with ecologists and citizen science um, and then and bring it all together. So, I say, yeah, it's it's kind of cobbling it all, it, it and there there are significant gaps, um, as you can see from the invasive species, and I'm building on that all of the time. But um, next year we hope to develop an app, um, that would basically link between ourselves and the National Biodiversity Data Centre. So when people send in records, we want to make it as easy as possible for people. We don't want to make it too laborious, or you know, just issues are out in a walk, they can take a picture. A grid coordinate that might we'll have to figure. I'm not IT savvy, as you could see from earlier on, um, but has a grid coordinate associated with it, and people's best guess of invasives if they think it is or it isn't, and then it's verified actually um, through either ourselves or the more, more often than not, if it's something that's quite maybe unique, um, something that's quite rare, it would be the National Biodiversity Data Centre. They have expert botanists, expert scientists in um, invasive species, so. Um, so they have access to all that information and that's particularly important. It's like the, the missionary map. Somebody spotted that in a parkland in Dublin and just said, oh, that looks a bit strange. I haven't seen anything native, you know, just, you know, and they weren't a biologist, just the obviously a love of nature, but they're just very observant. I think that was it. They're like, this is a bit peculiar. And they, you know, I'm going to say to the local authority and they went to the National Biodiversity and they were able to deal with it straight away. Because and that that's where the power of people comes in, actually being able to raise that flag so it can be dealt with. Um, the problem is when it escapes out into our environment, it's it's might be able to manage it, but I don't think we'll ever eradicate. Um, so it's really is trying to keep on top of it and equally trying to stop new species coming in. So and it's giving people the tools and giving them access to, to I suppose those contacts and making it as easy as possible. That's that's kind of my job. Yeah. On invasive species, one of the questions is, do you have a strategy for dealing with Japanese knotweed? And if so, would you be willing to share it? Very good question. Um, and it's very much, and I, I don't mean to overcomplicate it, but I'm, I apologize if I do. There's loads of guidelines out there. And it's interesting, as the guidelines appear, they're nearly immediately taken off. There was a very good one that was produced by oh, the Environment Agency in the UK, and it's no longer valid because of the complications with Japanese knotweed is particularly difficult. Um, we will have, I have some information um, and actually we'll be have, we'll have that available in the next two months. So videos, things like that, just make it very practical. If you have it on your land, the first thing to do is don't touch it, is the biggest thing, don't dig it. Um, 
And because if you did, because there was different advice was out there, like if you harrow it up loads, encourage it all to come up, then it'll weaken the plant. It actually does the complete opposite. Um, so it really is, um, it depends. Obviously, I said the herbicide is one of the more effective treatments of it. And unfortunately, it still is. The other options are to excavate. But the problem is because it is a, um, it's a regulated species, so it's like dealing with asbestos. If you excavate it from your site, you also have to excavate, it could be five to seven metres around the area that's infested, and then a metre and a half or two metres down. So you're talking about a huge volume of material and it's very, very expensive. But equally, we only have, I think there's two landfills in Ireland that accept that because it's considered contaminated material. Um, so the best treatment is, is to treat it in situ. And if it's a small stand, it's going to be work with somebody that is on, that is listed or regular. Yeah, so if you want to be able to treat, well, use um, what they call plant protection products, I think it's an awful phrase, um, herbicides, you really have to get somebody that is authorised to use that safely. I would not encourage anybody to go to B&Q and get Roundup themselves. First of all, it's not strong enough. And um, second of all, it's just from your own health and well-being and your, your local environment. So um, if, if you're based around Galway Ryark, I know that they, their local company, their landscape company, they do it. And um, they treat your stand. And then over a period of time, they, they will weaken the plant, certainly. And um, if it's a small stand, it's easier to get rid of. If it's there for a long time, it just it's it's more difficult. I know that is not as straightforward. I wish... If I had the answer to that, I'd be a multi-millionaire. Um, yeah, it's just, I'm so, yeah. So if somebody has a particular challenge or a particular site, um, Catherine, send on their details to me or get, you can send on my, yeah, my details to them. If they want to email me and maybe send me pictures or whatever, and I'll see if I can offer them maybe some more practical, but it's very much on a case-by-case -case basis. That's why I'm not kind of saying there's one, one fix for any situation. It's not the case. <laughs> Yeah, I did think that would be a more straightforward answer, but I yeah. see how complicated it is. Um, yeah, is, no, no, you're grand. It's good to hear. Um, another question here, um, that came in directly to me, so I won't give the details of, of who uh and asked it, but uh, they'd like to understand how environmental officers are to be approached and to deal with inquiries and requests for assistance from campaigning organizations, so from local groups and, and groups campaigning. Um, so yeah, so how, how would environmental officers uh, like yourself be approached? Um, and I guess why as well, um, which they don't ask, but it's something I'd like to know. When should people get in touch? Um, <clears throat> I suppose what, uh, yeah, how to, with regards to campaigns, um, as part of our remit, as part of the Biodiversity Action Plan, every biodiversity officer um, has to set up a biodiversity forum. So um, we would like to have representatives, say, from people like yourselves um, and from various different NGOs, organisations to contribute, say, to the Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, so that is that's the short term thing. So that's, say, next year. But um, in addition to that, then, if there are particular, I suppose, projects or particular campaigns, they can be discussed during that forum. So that's quite formal. And I suppose they'll only we will only really meet four times a year. Um, if it's something that can't be held off until those kind of engagements, then to contact um the council and the council will direct them to me or to their local biodiversity officer. Um and yeah I'm more than happy to speak to people. Um I have, you know, um it is obviously a very hectic remit. But when I can, I'll go out and meet people on site or, you know, and I'm very happy to, to advise people or direct them towards legislation or policy or guidelines. Um, and again, it's kind of, I suppose I'm looking at funding streams to support communities um, in any way I can. But yeah, I'm more than happy to, to share any knowledge I have with regards to, um, say, my background would be very much in policy and legislation. So if anybody needs any advice on that, I'm more than happy to share that. But yeah, to contact me, you, you'll have my details there if you want that, or if not, then through the, the council. Yeah. Um, yeah. Get through as many of these as possible. Uh, so uh, Aideen asks, as you know, wildflower meadows should be mowed in autumn. How do you do this when the sward is too high for ordinary mowers? 
Yeah, um, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. So they've actually purchased under the pollinator plant funding. I think they had um, they bought this kind of these little mini combine harvesters, for want of a better word. And in some places they're able to compost, but in other areas where they're very um, heavily used amenities, um, waste facilities won't accept them as compost. They go to waste because of potential contamination with waste. So um, other waste products. Um, so that's what we're doing at the moment. So it is it's, it's specialist machinery. Now, if, if you're talking about your own garden, um, if you have, say, I, I'll give you the example, I suppose, of my front garden. So it was, I mown it, you know, I, I've come from a town. I kind of gardened how my mother would have gardened. I had no other um, frame of reference. So in keeping your garden nice and neat and tidy and so the neighbours won't talk, be talking about you. Um, but obviously, kind of as I evolved into um, ecology and environmental science and just kind of, I changed obviously the way I garden. I garden very much for wildlife now, and I um so I leave my front lawn and my back garden is a very different beast. Um, so until you get what we call the sward, so the height of grass down, you actually have to mow more frequently. So if you leave your dandelions in early spring, then mow three or four times the first year, three times during the next year. And what you're doing, but the the big thing about that is that you collect the grass. You don't mulch that grass into the lawn. So you're actually collecting it with your, your mowing bucket or whatever. Um, because I suppose that's what I would have done. It would have been cut. It would, the grass would have just been mulched. I wouldn't collect the grass. And then the grass is... So the, so the grass is very nutrient hungry. If you remove the nutrients, it doesn't favour, say, the ryegrass species. Um, the clovers, they just love nitrogen, love nutrients. So you're depriving them of that. And what happens then, you actually get the opportunity for the um, herbs, flowers, forbs. They actually start to emerge. And the thing is, because if, you're, if your grass is really heavy throughout the whole summer, it actually and all these heavy winds we've been having, very strong winds, the grass, the tall grass is actually collapsing over on any little flower flowers that are trying to emerge. So until you bring that grass down, you mow three to four times a year until you can see the grass coming down and more flowers emerging. For me, it took three years. And I have, I think there was five orchid species in my grass this year. Um, and I've only mown it, I mow paths around it, but I just, I mow it now whenever a dry day again, but that's, so I have it, I mowed it kind of very early spring, or very, like say February, then left it and I mow it now. So yeah, it's just, it gives you more time to sit down with a cup of tea and admire your lovely meadow and all that, that comes with it. So there actually is guidelines in the pollinator um, website, pollinators.ie, and that kind of explains that theory. Um, if you have short grassland, then of course, yeah, just leave it until um, until September, um, early October to cut it. But if you've got a very heavy amenity grassland that was sown in there, you have to weaken that grassland to be able for it to be more productive for native species. And those native species, their seeds will be in the soil and they're just looking for space to come up and they don't like it too nutrient rich. That helps. Thank you very much, Paula. Okay. <laughs> uh, cheers. Thanks, Aideen. Um, so yeah, I think this next question was coming off the back of um, when you were talking about removing the noxious weeds by hand in the community uh, project where they built the pond. Um, and I know you mentioned leaving some thistles, but you know, making sure they just don't overtake over overtake the whole area. Um, so the question here is, how do you reconcile the elimination of ragwort with the needs of the cinnabar moths? Sorry, be... Catherine, I've lost you there. Sorry, I lost you there. Could you repeat that? I just yeah. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, the question was how how do you reconcile the elimination of ragwort with the needs of the cinnabar moth? hundred percent. And yeah, so that's what I was speaking with regards to um, our other insects. Um, it's really, we're only thinning. Um, it's not removing them all, not by any stretch of the imagination. It's just um, just to, min to minimize, I suppose, not minimize. We still have them there, but where they become dominant and then they're out competing other species that have value to other species. But I, I completely take your point and there's really a balance to be struck. And equally, if we if we are um, hand pulling ragwort, um, sometimes it's pulled on the first year before it comes to flower. Um, but if there's any insects or anything on it, it's left. You know, so it is, it's very much, everybody's trained to know what to do and we leave it as much as possible. But we're not excluding it from the grassland by, by at all. As well as that, there's 
archaic piece of legislation out there that we're required to actually manage noxious weeds. Um, and that's really from a, from a grazing point of view. So there's that requirement, but we're, we're pushing against that. Um, but there is just that balance to be struck. Um, but in our public space, you see, there's a pathway from Black Rock Tower going along um, the bottom of the golf course there. And we just leave, it's, right, it's full of ragworth, they just leave all that there. But in the community gardens where they're trying to establish um, more diversity in this ward, it's just, it's very selective removal. Um, but not, not, not obliteration, if that's the right phrase, yeah. Will your work and the biodiversity plan link with the local authority climate action plan and the local economic and community plan? Yeah, very closely. Um, I suppose the way I've described um the climate action plan and the biodiversity action plan, like they're really kind of you know, um, like a railroad railroad track. You know, they're running parallel to each other, but they're integrally linked. Um, and the the economic plan, I suppose. There is significant issues, I suppose, something that I'm working kind of further up through, through management and open to government bodies is really the support for biodiversity action. Um, the LGMA, there's, there's a huge amount of funding, I mean, a huge amount, but comparison to biodiversity funding. Yes, so Jeremy asks, do biodiversity offices oversee that all development projects are compliant with the requirements of the Aarhus Convention? Which is another interesting policy question. A very interesting one. Very interesting. Um, hmm. I, don't necessarily, I suppose from local planning, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and I suppose, yeah, if you look at the different planning, I suppose, legislation, so with regards to impact assessment, um, so local planning and developments there under Part 8, if they don't require, um, so we call it appropriate assessment. So that, that assessment that's done is part from for the um, habitat directive. And I find I suppose the part A planning isn't as there is still community engagement, but it's not in the same kind of maybe public agreement as it would if it went to part 10. So if it goes to part 10, it's to the board. And there's a consultation process with both, but I don't know if the part A planning it it, it complies, but I don't know if it's as visible as say part 10 that goes to board Panola. Um, it's a very interesting one, actually. I want to have a, have a think about that. But I suppose from my experience and it coming from both sides, um, yeah, and I suppose that's the thing. I suppose for individuals that are interested in in public development, um, that they they do seek out those plans and they do challenge them or make a submission as required. Um, but it is it's a it's a different format. It's but I say there's still public engagement, and I say that that would it would achieve um, the requirements under, under our house. Um, and then with regards to the environmental um, assessments requirements, they're set out. So we would, um, from the national guidelines, national policy and legislation, that informs our city development plan, which underpins our development. And the requirements for um, environmental assessment are contained within that for all plans. Um, so all plans, policies um, require appropriate assessment. So they would certainly meet the environmental law and um and the public participation and access to environmental information um, is there through the consultation process. We just hit eight o'clock. If we, if I could ask you, Paula, would you mind staying on an extra 10 minutes to finish up the few questions that are here? Yeah, that's okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, and of course, if anyone does like would like to drop out if they're on, on a deadline to go get dinner or anything like that, um, feel free and um, this is being recorded so it'll be sent out to you anyway as well um, so Craig says Paula your enthusiasm and energy is palpable which I couldn't have said better myself what advice okay. have you for new biodiversity officers to enable them to cope in an organisation that has too little resources and an endless amount of work to do <laughs> which sounds oh. uh, so such as avoiding getting overwhelmed um, and how can we in the voluntary and PPN sector help and support our new biodiversities here in Wicklow or of course anywhere? Um, that was lovely. Thanks very much. <laughs> you brought tear to my eye. Yeah, it is, it is very overwhelming. I'm, the, I'm in the role for a year and a half now. And um, yeah, it's just, there is a lot of overwhelm. I, I won't lie to you. You're, because I think my first year when I was there, I don't think anybody knew what to do with me. The position wasn't there before. And then our heritage officer is very much... Um, involved in the built area, amazing at it, um, amazing archaeologist, conservation architect. Um, but 
I suppose the natural history was very much clear, was being managed by our, our parks department. So yeah, I was kind of submerged in, in planning applications because I think that's, yeah, that would be my background, I suppose, and they just kind of put me in there. But um, yeah, I've managed to emerge from that. Um, but what's happened in the interim is that the Heritage Council, because of this programme, I've spoken to them directly about these challenges that I had when I first got into the job. And it's of no fault of anybody. Um, it was just, yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't an easy start, let's put it that way. So the Heritage Council now, have, they have a support network, really, for all the new biodiversity officers. Um, I was just on the WhatsApp group there earlier on, just before this call. So um, we all have very different backgrounds, different disciplines. But just when it gets it gets tough, and Catherine um, Casey, who's who looks after us, um, like she's in the Heritage Council for oh numerous years, and has amazing wealth of um, of knowledge, and is used to dealing with with planning, government departments, um, all the legislation and the issues that go along with that, and so she's just a, a fantastic support um, to all of us, um, as well as the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, again, what fantastically under resourced. Um, so help each other out. But I have to say, um, like I mentioned probably at the very beginning, really, with um, the Friends of Merlin Woods, um, Caroline Forest Park, um, Barna Woods, Barna Tidy Towns, the Friends of Barna Woods, it means a few of conservation, Galway, oh, of conservation volunteers, Galway. they're just um, too numerous. I don't want to leave anybody out, God forbid. Um, Bat Conservation, local, it's wildlife trust, lo local wildlife trust, it, it, they're numerous. And I actually haven't, I'm starting to get more involved. I'm starting to come out of um, the office and getting more involved and just wanting to work and support the amazing enthusiasm that's out there. And I'm just I'm blown away, really, by the time and the effort that people put in on their own time. And, and time is so precious. Um, yeah, it's just it is awesome. So, um, yeah, citizen science, I say we couldn't do our job without them. A lot of that data, as I said, that came from the National Biodiversity so that Data Centre came from people like yourselves, it came from people taking the time to put up those records. And they relied on so heavily, not just by ourselves, but also for development. And um, when I worked in the private sector, we would look to those records all of the time. And I don't think you get the credit that's deserved. Um, it's very, very powerful, very powerful tool to have that data because it defends um, arguments with regards to preservation of say habitats or species. Um, so mapping, um, I love maps. Um, uh, big kind of uh, geographical information systems. So I think having those maps and having them available to the public, I think I probably that question was kind of asked earlier on about the mapping being available. I will look to have that data available on our websites that people can access it. Um, some of it isn't publicly, I'm not allowed publicly to share it. It's that the National Land Cover Map that will change, I'm sure, in time. It's, um, we have to pay for it at the moment. So um, but I'm sure that will change. But even so, even without that, we have we have um, paired back versions or types of versions of that. So to share that information with people would be really important, again, to inform maybe their own biodiversity, local biodiversity action plans. But um, yeah, and I think my job now is to get out and, um, and meet people and see what support they need, if they need equipment or if they need training, um, yeah, workshops, whatever. So I, when I go for my funding next year, I can see if I can um, allocate some resources um, and training whatever to, to local communities to support them in their their citizen science yeah well, that might be step one then in how people can help you is just making themselves known to you and what they do yeah that's it that's it yeah um so as i say uh as i said we've got no, numerous groups in the city um and the biodiversity officer won't have representatives from every individual group we'll probably have collectives um maybe through yourselves or various different groups but um I think as part of that, then I thought I will meet individual groups um, and see then how they can be supported or how their voices can be heard. Um, yeah, that 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 is something, and it's, it's critical. It's critical for me for the biodiversity because I need it. It needs to be something that's tangible and works for for the people of Galway City, um, and it makes sense and meets their ambitions or what they their vision for what Galway should look like in the future. Mm. Excellent. And I think that also answered the question of what sort of liaison is there between all biodiversity officers around the country, that you do have that support network there and, and you're all on a WhatsApp group supporting each other. Yeah, that's it. And um, and sharing um, pictures of um, of mammal droppings. You know, it's really lovely. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So, yeah, so um, if anybody has any nice pictures of that badger scat, then send them out to me. <laughs> 
Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll try to run through. I know we're, we're creeping up even to our 10 minute mark now. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few a few handy short ones here. Um, Aiden is saying that Himalayan balsam is running wild in Leitrim, expanding along streams everywhere. Have you details of any project that tackles this species in particular? Actually, I'm very good question. And actually, it's one species that actually I think we could be very effective in eradicating if it's done at the right time of year. <clears throat> there was a project down in Cork. Oh, it's the black water that was on abandoned. And I might have to get details for your captain and share them. And they call it balsam bashing, and where local communities go out and you can actually, if it's a small enough stand, you can pull it. Actually, just pull it before it goes to flower. So it spreads by seed. And that's how it's dispersing, particularly along water courses. When it goes to seed, the seed's just delivered and deposited as the river floods or, you know, just it deposits along the bank. So very challenging. But if it goes to seed, the plant then itself, it won't produce new plants. So that is, so it's actually a very, very satisfying plant to actually deal with. Um, but you have obviously water safety concerns there. So people would obviously have to, um, you know, buddying and people tie ropes to each other and have um, life life vests on and all of that. So it's um, from the water safety point of view, it is challenging. But as a species eradication, yeah, it can be done. The thing about any of those, the same with um, giant hogweed, again, another one that spreads by seed, you have to get to the mothership. You have to go back to the source um, because it will continually reinfest. So the, there, is there a in Leitrim? They're established yet. I'd have to, I'd have to have a look and see. But they need to get a survey done. And, and because of the colour of um, of our invasive species, they can be picked up through air photography in certain circumstances. Depends if there's woodland, it, it's very difficult, but they might be able to do some maybe remote sensing is what we call it, looking at um, air photography, or actually get ecologists actually up along the water courses to find the source of the infestation and work downstream. But it actually can be done. And the Mulcair in, um, in Limerick, I'm working with... Um, Nicholas Hedge, he's very good. But I've had to be working on invasive species for years. Um, and he has eradicated, oh, I think it's a 20 kilometers of, of giant hogweed, but it won't reinvest because he got to the source of it. And often the source of it is at a monastery or um a domain or a you know a big house that you know wanted to put in these wild and wonderful, beautiful, exotic plants. And we're and you see it around Galway, a lot of the, the escapes are out of the um they are the, the gardens, the ornamental gardens. So um we're often out there. So, so it's, he actually will target uh, he looked at the old six inch mapping and see where there was old houses or old estates. And he'd start from there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Diversity in Limerick, who've done a lot of that kind of work as well. So I'll send on their details too. Um so I think there's only two questions left, so we're, we're getting there. Um are local authorities now obliged to have independent biodiversity officers? And in fact, are the, I, and my own question on, on to that, are they independent or are they very closely linked with the local authorities? Um they're very closely, I suppose in my role because I'm paid directly by the council, whereas I say there's about five of us, five or six of us in the in the um country like that, and then the other by our services are paid by the heritage officer, the funded by the heritage officer. Um, so, but we all sit in the council, you know, and we all have a job to do, and we all have very strong legislation and policy to uphold. Um, so, yeah, and it's 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 a very distinct role. It's not, I suppose, if you're familiar with local authority structure and um, different levels of engineers and admin and all of the kind of the plat the political levels, but um, we're aside to that if you know what I mean so it's a very just a very distinct role and our job is very I suppose targeted by diversity so um yeah as well, the concern that there's um sort of a bias there or um I suppose that's probably it would be a very um genuine question but um I think and I, I've never I have had issues in the past as a, as a private consultant um, but I have a code of conduct to to abide by, um, and yeah, I can, I have, yeah, I, I, we did no problems, and any of the people that are in those roles would have no problem standing up to anything that goes on in the council. As I say, we have the backup of the Heritage Council, but we also have the backup of legislation and the remit for our job and national policy. So, um, yeah, we can, we can certainly carve out 
a space for ourselves and uh, and challenge any of that that might go on. Um, I, I've I've heard as well that the, the all roles across every county should have a biodiversity officer by the end of twenty twenty four. So that's the kind of the timeline. Um, I think we're working with across the country. Yes, yeah, the ambition wondering. is um, it's finding people. A lot of ecologists have left the industry for one reason or another, or a lot of scientists. So it's um yeah, they're they're struggling with filling those roles, but they will, they will eventually. Um, it's just taking a little bit longer than what they'd anticipated. But um, yeah, they are they're driving on. But yeah, some fantastic, oh, like not some, they're all all amazing. Rosina Joyce is the um Galway County uh, biodiversity officer. Barry Lockin is in Clare. Um, I was Barry from when he was a graduate. Um, bog restoration, if that's of interest to anybody, yeah, just a fountain of knowledge. And um, Rosina's been basically doing the job for years. She's community warden and she's been working with communities for a long time now. So, um, yeah, just great people. And just, and we do it because we just, we love, love the environment, we love biodiversity and um, and working with people. So, yeah. Sounds like there's a wealth of knowledge there. I'd love to, to be in a meeting of all of you and just hear all your expertise. <laughs> it would be amazing. <laughs> I get a little bit of imposter syndrome sometimes, like, oh my God, all these amazing people. <laughs> and we all have to do our little our little bit, yeah. Absolutely. And sure all constantly learning more as well. Oh, um, that's it. We did a school day, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the last question I have here uh, from Deborah, do biodiversities mainly engage with towns and communities or is there also engagement with farming sector? Not as much in the farming sector, unless the unless it's part of a community group or something, you know, um, I suppose it, I can't really say because I suppose in the city, it's not, no, I am looking at conservation grazing. Um, again, I'll probably go back to an earlier question with regards to the equipment that's used for mowing lawns, but I'm looking at um, working with um, heritage breeds, Dexter cattle um, for middle management, but um, so I'm working with a, a land, with a farmer that's not directly on their land, say. Um, there would be certainly the Hare's Corner that would have evolved from you know the Burn Life Project uh, with regards to conservation grazing um, and water management and all of that. Um, I don't know. Now, we're very close, we, we work very close with Law Pro, um, Local Authority Waters Office. So, um, yeah, that's a very good question. I'm sorry, I don't think I can answer that fully. I'd imagine we could, but largely it's it's with communities and again. Um, if we can advise what they're doing on their land, we, we certainly will. We'll, we'll help as much as possible. But um, you see, if it's anything to do with acres or rural environmental schemes or something like that, we really wouldn't be very involved in that. Now, that's down to the Department of Agriculture and they they have a number of initiatives and their payments and all of that. So that's kind of outside of our, our role. Now, we work with them, but not as closely as they were with the landowners. That's great. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's lots of thank yous and very interesting talks and uh, thank you for your precious times coming in in the comments. Um, so, yeah, I just want to thank everyone else as well. Thank you to everyone who showed up for the night. Uh, thanks for your time and for listening and your patience and your questions and um, your interest as well in, in, the, in the topic. Um, and thank you again to Paula for showing up and for giving us such a wonderful overview uh, and some very uh, some great insight into the role and into the possibilities through it as well. It's very exciting that uh, that you're in the position and that there's there's more and more coming on board across the country. Um, and yeah, so as we'll send out the recording and the slides and everything like that afterwards to everyone. If anyone has any further questions, they can send them on to myself um, and we'll see if we can get them answered for you. Um, and other than that, thank you very much and have a good night. Thanks very much, everybody. It was lovely. Thanks very much. I really appreciate you giving up your time to listen to me with Ron. But yeah, it was lovely. If I can help in any way, just drop me a line.